Welcome to the County Commissioner Forum for Jackson County. Um, Jackson County Campaign for Liberty's mission is to promote and defend the great American principles of individual liberty, constitutional government, sound money, free markets, and peace Amen. through education, issue advocacy, and grassroots mobilization. Tonight, we're here to educate ourselves because we have an election coming up. And we need to decide who we're going to vote for to take some seats on the county commission um, whose roles and duties are numerous and varied. Counties are complex organiza organizations operating literally dozens of distinct business functions. The job of the commissioner is complex. They must be able to understand each level of their responsibility to effectively lead a county. I would like to turn this over to Tom Steen and Mary Johnson, Johnson co-chairs for Jackson County American for Prosperity. Mary, so I could have read Debbie's script when it comes to what AFP stands. Or it's basically constitutionally limited governments and free markets. That's our two primary principles that we try to educate people on. AFP is actually, there's an AFP foundation and AFP. AFP by itself advocates on issues. Tonight we're educating because we're helping to educate you on your candidates. So tonight is actually being hosted by, co-hosted by AFP Foundation. So I'm going to turn this over to Tom, who's going to help us get this rolling, turn it over to our moderator. At the risk of ruining Kevin's tight schedule, i got to share one reminiscence with you. Uh, a lot of years ago, about the time I started high school, I moved to a little town in New Hampshire. I'd never lived in the north before. And I discovered what New England town halls were all about. Most unique thing, uh, it stuck with me the rest of my life. But I like to look around this room and other meetings that we've had in this room and think back to the fame of New England town halls, the idea that citizens, voting citizens, involved, interested citizens come together to talk about the issues and the candidates, compare ideas, learn what they can, and make the best judgments they possibly can, which is what this program is all about here this evening. Um, my duty at this point is to introduce the moderator for the evening. Um, Craig Fornak, who many of you know as the host of the Sunrise Show on KCMX. Uh, <clears throat> Craig has admitted that he has had a day job uh, involving 13 years as a marketing consultant. He is now the morning host on KCMX, Monday through Friday from 6 to 9 a.m. Craig? Excellent. Thank all you. Yours. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everyone. I want to welcome our candidates this evening. I know you've got a very busy schedule. Appreciate you coming out, answering questions. For opening statements, five minutes each, uh, I've got four pieces of paper with their names on it, and I'm going to kind of just pull them out like this. We're going to pick one for the start. The first order will be uh, Joel Acunzi, followed by Rick Dyer, Followed by Colleen Roberts, followed by Henry Marlowe. You have five minutes for your first entrance uh, statement. So, Joel, welcome to the podium. The microphone's on. And you can use the microphone at the table okay. if you'd like. And I will tell you that microphone just needs to be up close. Would you prefer that I stand? Yeah, or, please uh, use the podium. Turn it on. Yeah, we can't see you. It's on. It's really weak. It's really weak. Podium. Yeah. Is better? Okay, good. Well, listen, uh, thank you very much for having us here tonight. Uh, it's an important uh, 
primary coming up. I know you're all interested to find out what we're all about. So let me just start by saying that my wife and I moved here to the area 34 years ago. Our three children were born and raised here. Uh, we, they went to uh, Cascade uh, Christian High Schools, Grace Christian Schools in the elementary, and then all three of them graduated from Southern Oregon University. Um, I've spent most of my career life uh, in, in the business community, 40 years of it. Uh, in the latter part of my career, I was the Western Division President for uh, a large uh, corporation. I had the 14 Western States plus uh, British Columbia, so I did a lot of work with multinational, multi-party, and multi-million dollar transactions. Uh, the last 10 years I've spent uh, as a real estate broker, and I specialize in rural, farm, and ranch, and commercial properties. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, 12 years ago or so, I ran into some difficulties with some of my own property. I do have, I guess you may call me a large property owner in the, in the uh, valley. And I ran into, into some difficulties, and so it, it, it brought to my attention the complexities of land use uh, and how it relates to policy and comprehensive planning. So from that, I was appointed to the Committee for Citizens' Involvement. I was there for two years, and from there I was then appointed by two separate boards of commissioners to the Planning Commission, and I'm now in my seventh year on the Planning Commission. Now, on the Planning Commission, we are watchdogs for the planners that bring applications to the planner, Planning Commission so that we can make recommendation and decisions to the board. And we look at it in a micro perspective so that when the board receives what our recommendation or decision is, they are well aware that it has been well vetted out. And so they may have additional questions, but what we try to do is make sure that we have decisions that are pretty much bulletproof so that they, uh, the appeal process will be shortened. In the state of Oregon, we have a very re restrictive um, planning procedure and uh, land use um, procedure that is uh, uh, relegated by the statewide planning goals. There are 19 planning goals. Those are imposed upon the counties. They are, uh, they are actually policy of the state. There are guidelines to work from them, but from those goals we make our land use uh, ordinances, our kind of comprehensive planning, and our policies. And from that we get um, uh, quasi-judicial and also legislative results. Lastly, because this group has a lot to do with liberty and prosperity, I just wanted to say I'm a 10th generation American. My first uh, generation got here in 1710. The second generation got our first 100 acres from William Penn Ayers and an Indian chief by the name of Alumapai from the Schuylkill Indian tribe in eastern Pennsylvania. The third generation, we had three people in the Revolutionary War with the Pennsylvania militia and also the Western uh, Frontier um, Rangers. And we've been farming in the United States for 304 years across the United States. I'm happy to be American. I'm happy to be here in Jackson County. I'm happy to have protected you as a volunteer for the last nine years uh, as a planning commissioner for your rights and for uh, private property rights and good land use planning. Thank you. Rick Dyer is next. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you for having me, and thank you, uh, Campaign for Liberty and Americans for Prosperity, for uh, hosting this event. Appreciate the forum. Uh, my name is Rick Dyer, and I'm running for Jackson County Commissioner, Position 1. Uh, I live here in Medford with my wife, Kara, and my son, Bryce, who just turned 10 on Friday. Uh, big birthday party for him. Um, I'm a 38-year resident of Southern Oregon. Uh, I went to junior high and high school. Over in Grants Pass, I graduated from Hidden Valley High School in 1982. I from there went on to Southern Oregon University, Southern Oregon State College at the time. I think we remember those days, uh, where I received my uh, bachelor's degree in business administration and accounting. Um, a few years later, I decided to continue on uh, with my education, and I decided to go back to law school. Um, I had to do it as a distance learning program because of the realities of life, uh, making a living, raising a family. Uh, I was actually serving, and still am, serving on the RBTD board at the time. Uh, so I couldn't move away uh, to attend law school anywhere else. Uh, but I did receive my JD, and I passed the uh, bar exam in California in 2011, non-practicing. Non uh, and I'll explain it. California, uh, I had to take the bar exam there because of the distance learning degree Oregon would not allow uh, 
need to take the bar exam here. But all of that being said, I think my, my greatest education has come from my 25 years uh, running and, and owning local businesses. Um, it's there. You learn things like fiscal restraint and fiscal responsibility and living within a budget. Uh, and the fact that every decision you make is vital and can make or break your business. So you really have to contemplate and put a lot of thought into each decision. Uh, especially the last six years, uh, I've been a general contractor. and I think we all are aware of what's going on or what has been uh, the reality of the construction trade the last six years where your next bad decision could be your last. Uh, and, I've, and I've been able to make it through that. And uh, again, I think that's uh, due to just good fiscal, fiscally responsible decision making. Um, I also know from my years in business, uh, the frustrations that not just businesses but individuals do feel with the regulation that's imposed, the uh, burdens and, and barriers that seem to be placed on us uh, by government. And that, that's something that, again, uh, I have felt personally. Um, and I do recognize and realize the necessary role of government, but I firmly believe uh, a government that governs least governs best. And I also am a big believer in personal responsibility and, again, uh, personal rights and liberties. And I truly feel the best way we can help individuals and business succeed is in most cases just getting government out of their way. Thank you. Colleen Roberts. Good evening. Thanks for coming out and getting to know your candidates and caring about your government and Thanks for uh, AFP and Campaign for Liberty for hosting us so we can get our message out and you can hear um, our opinions and our stand on government. And before I get started, I'll tell you a little bit about myself in case for those of you who don't know anything about me. I am a native of Southern Oregon, graduating from Rogue River High School just a few years ago. <laughs> and, uh, but I went on to college at Forest Grove uh, Pacific University and that's where I met my husband, Steve. And we've been married for 38 years, and we settled back in the Rogue Valley in Eagle Point and had our three boys and end up raising them in Prospect, and it's a great place to raise little guys. And But they're grown now, and they have children of their own. They've given us 12 grandkids in a few short years, and I've heard grandchildren are the reward for not killing your own kids, and it's true. <laughs> they're really a blessing. But Steve, um, I don't know why I'm buzzing. Raise it up a little bit. Anyway, um, Steve's been with me, uh, hanging through with all my ambitions of life, and one of my first was I wanted to have my own business, and I had a little hobby, and I turned it into a business. I licensed it in my home called Sensational Suites many years ago, so I could stay home with my kids, and my dad was a business owner, so I don't know if it was just in my blood or what, but I found real joy in producing something, running a budget, and making money. And then a few short years later, my sister Shauna turned it into a partnership and we opened our own storefront location and we've been at it for about 21 years. And through that time, we've seen a lot of economic up and down. And through leadership and um, our strength of organization and discipline, we've been able to hang on to our business. And you see a lot of businesses not so lucky to do that anymore. And we've seen a lot of in those 21 years, a lot of government uh, in, influx and uh, imposition on the businesses. And uh, that is a concern as well. Through that time, I finished my bachelor's degree um, in business administration and pursued and attained, attained a master's degree. And it's that combination of education and experience that almost any uh, private sector business demands of a CEO and public as well that has the experience and the academic behind it. A master's degree brings some proficiency in finance and uh, uh, system analysis and statistics and lots of fun stuff and um, human resources, uh, all kinds of management experience. And since um, I ran in 2012, I have, I think, attended nearly every, with a few exceptions, Wednesday, 
Board of Commissioner public meeting. And I had the privilege of reporting the news to the Upper Rogue Independent for our citizens in uh, the Upper Rogue to be informed as to what the government in Jackson County is doing. And I had noticed an a, a, a increase of non-government organizations having an uh, imposition in our government decisions. They're not elected and they're making policy on our land use, on our timber, and on our water. And I find that very problematic. And also an increase of state and federal controls coming in and just squelching the life out of our local control. And um, a lot of that just comes with money, doesn't it? And there, there's no free lunch. And with that comes strings attached and control. And I think our commissioners need to be on top. Some of that is mandated, and a lot of it is discretionary. And sometimes I think we need to say no and not take that money. Live frugally and live free. And I've not seen any money that's come through the commissioner meeting saying, no, we don't need that. They take it. And it's, it's very tr troublesome. And I hope to talk about some of those programs when you ask your questions later on. Um, but um, one of our main problems in our community, in our county, and you'll hear it probably from every candidate, is our economic development. And um, our natural resources must be open. They've been blocked from us, whether it's our trees or our mining. And um, just last um, summer, a federal judge ordered our BLM to increase timber harvest. And where was our commissioners? Were they at the table insisting on coordination? I, if they were, why are we enter, entering another fire season with our uh, economic uh, gold mine going to go up in flames and us breathing smoke? But I am I'm not for new taxes. I don't believe we can fee, fine, or tax our citizens to prosperity. And I'm a Republican that believes in small government, local tr control, less taxes, and less spending. It'd be an honor and a privilege to serve you with constitutional foundational principles for freedom, with conservative values and with common sense leadership and we've got to break this good old boy system because I tell you I am not a good old boy. <laughs> Henry Marlowe. Good evening. Thank you for coming. I appreciate your interest. First let me start out I am not a professional politician. Good. I'm a citizen politician. I'm here for four years. I'm here to make an influence on the county. My background, I'm somewhat, you might call a dreamer. By the time I uh, finished high school from, in Dallas, Texas, I uh, was going to become a manufacturer of TV dinners. So by the time I graduated, I had gone through the entire selection of books in the Dallas Public Library dealing with science and industry. After that, I entered the University of Texas as a double E major, electrical engineering. I then transferred to uh, California Polytechnic in San Luis Obispo as a double E major. After that, I went into the Air Force for four years as an electronics technician, aircraft, navigation, communications, light weather radar. After that, I, I went into business. I got my teaching credentials issued by UC Berkeley, and I taught junior college and I taught high school. So I have, I know how the school system works. I've been there. I do not have a degree. So they say, well, how do you teach? You don't have a degree. You don't have to have. You just have to be very, very, very good at what you do. And it always helps if they solicit you and you, not them. So I, I taught high school for a year, academic year. And then I, uh, I created another business in L.A. dealing with heavy industry. I sold uh, air breathing products to hospitals, uh, air assembly tools to uh, automotive assembly plants, steel foundries, etc. And after my business experience, I took a break, and then I went to work for government. I took a job with the County of Santa Clara. I know a lot of people, Hank, don't mention California. Well, let me tell you. As California goes, so goes the rest of the country. And this is where I was hammer forged in the political system. I went to work there. I was qualified for it. I went to work as a, as an electrician. I love people, and this provided me an opportunity to uh, 
interface at every level of government. I could be one day in the executive office, the next day in the jails, the next day in the hospitals, the next day in the welfare office, the next day in transportation. And everywhere I went, I always was interested in asking questions. I loved people. And the jails were a fabulous place. And I want to tell you right now, the jails are not a place of rehabilitation and they're not a place of punishment. And anyone wishing to discuss that later, I'll be more than happy. I have a thousand jailhouse stories for you. I have a thousand education stories for you. After, after a while in government, I, I became really upset at what I was seeing. Things were not working right. We're heading down the road to disaster. And so I ran for public office in California. At the county level, they spent $226,000 talking over me. You ran up against the machine. I did not win the seat, but I didn't lose because it was the education. It was the finest class in civics that you could ever take, where you saw government as it really worked. Uh, I finished uh, my stint with the government in the county hospital. And the federal government had come along. You have to understand, <clears throat> Obamacare has nothing to do with health care. It's a tax plan. Even the Supreme Court says it's a tax plan. Prior to the Clinton administration, the American medical system was the envy of the world. No one was denied health care. If you needed health care, you didn't have the money. It was free. Why did you need insurance? It was free. No taxes, no fees. It's free. We routinely gave away wheelchairs for $12,000. They had ventilators. They had special equipment on them for people that needed it. These people could not pay. These people, there, there was no way. It was, it was just free. We had people in the hospital that, uh, what you don't understand about Obamacare is, I need to wrap this up. Anyone wishing to talk more about this issue, I'll be more than happy to stay and discuss it with you, one-on-one -on -one or whatever. Uh, again, um, I'm back in politics. Uh, we're going down the road. We're, up, we're approaching where the sign says, bridges out ahead. So what are we going to do? To those who are interested, when I have more time, I'm down to 10 seconds. I can go a long way. When you're no teacher, time goes away. I am out of time. If you would like to discuss these issues later, I'll be more than happy to. Thank you very much. Our next portion of the uh, forum this evening is some dialogue between the different positions. So I'll have one of the candidates start in position uh, three, and I'll have one of the candidates start in seat uh, one, and they'll get two minutes to respond. I have these four tabs. I'm going to have the Republican party chairman, just pick a tab for me. Okay. Joel Acunzi. I should have bought a lottery ticket. <laughs> that's right, that's right. You want again. Uh, you would get a question for your uh, challenger in uh, position three, and Colleen would get two minutes to respond to your question. And you can ask, just trade with the mic if you'd like to do that as well. Just pass the mic back and forth that's on the table. It's pretty dead. Is it on at all? Speak or is up. it red lights on? There you go. Hello? Yes. 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 Okay, so my question would be, and these are just uh, random questions that you would like to ask your challenger. Yeah. Exactly. So I'll ask uh, my challenger what is her position on receiving uh, federal funds? My, my position on federal funds, I would look at each one. I wouldn't just blanketly accept any federal fund. I believe uh, the federal government has a lot of uh, strings that they pull when you take their money. Some of them, like I stated in my opening statement, are mandatory. And some are very discretionary, some dire consequences. And I think we need to be very smart when we look at taking money. There is no free lunch. And I think we need to look at what comes into our county, weigh the consequences of taking it. I know at another interview they asked me, well, so you wouldn't take any, any money? And I said, no, I would take some, but I think we need to be very smart. You know, the, the debtor is a slave to the lender. And I think uh, we have to be guarded, and we, we better start right away because we're losing ground. 
Colleen, you now have a question for Joel. Okay. Um, I guess the only question I have for Joel, um, you commented on protecting private property rights, and I just wanted to know why your, serv your service on the Planning Commission, how did you protect private property rights, and did you ever have a dissenting vote on any of the progression of, like, RPS or any of the controls that have come on our land use issues? Well, this is my seventh year on the Planning Commission. I've probably been through a hundred or more sessions. We have them every second Thursday and fourth Thursday of the month. So for seven years, uh, I'm in my seventh year, as I said. And I'll give you one example, private roads. Some time ago, the fire marshals wanted to mandate that all private roads in the county be paved. That includes roads that are clear up on the Green Springs. Uh, we also only allowed 12 dwellings per private road. Uh, over a four-year time frame and through a number of dissents and a number of negotiations which we have on the Planning Commission because we have five members on the Commission, three of us have to agree uh, to move, you know, in quorum to move uh, a motion forward. Uh, I was able to influence the Commission and ultimately the Board to go to uh, simply um, uh, gravel surfaced roads as opposed to the requirement for paved roads which made it much more likely for those property owners to be able to develop their lands and also to increase the ability to have up to 25 homes on a private road out in the rural areas as opposed to simply 12. Uh, that's just one example. RPS, which stands for Regional Problem Solving, is an agreement between the six major cities in our area. That process took 12 years to go through. It was noticed numerous times in all of the papers by city and by county. The purpose of Regional Problem Solving was to give us more latitude, more local authority, to circumvent a number of the overarching state-required mandates for land use planning and let us develop our area more locally to accommodate a doubling of the population over the next likely 50 years. Thank you. Colleen, you're up. Another question? Yes, we have a couple more times. We have a couple more questions. You can go. Wow, I really didn't come to ask my questions. I was hoping to answer your guys' questions. Um, I really have no questions. I want to hear um, the citizens' concerns and um, how we'll lead. Uh, um, Joel, what, what do you have to say? <laughs> um, we can turn over to the other team. Do you have any questions for me? Yeah, I'm happy to do that. If you want to relinquish, we'll move over to position one. Okay, let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Chuck. Okay, Henry. Yep. <clears throat> You're up. I would like to see you uh, ask a question. The microphone's on the table of your opponent related to the county commissioner position. Of course, we have to figure out the technicalities here. Hello. Oh, testing. Okay. Is it, is it on? Yeah, no. I think that's just my loud voice. <laughs> Feel free to use either mic. Good link. Actually, I have no questions. And the reason is, the differences that we're proposing and, and the leadership that we're going to be talking about. What we're concerned with is, history can be a very cruel teacher if you do not learn your lessons the first time. We are zoned for earthquake, and there's no preparations. We used to have a, uh, a system called civil defense in which there, there were preparations, there was food, there was water, there was space blankets. It was stockpiled in every public building, church, and it was not administered by FEMA, it was administered by people who had a vested interest in the community. We need to bring that back. Well, the second thing is, the most pressing issue with the county. See, my position is, from this leadership position, you, you provide direction. There are there's skills within the county that take care of the mundane mechanics of, of this operation. 
We need a new direction. One thing is our association with the internet, internet, which is becoming, taking on the image of the beast. It's controlling everything. It controls your political life. It controls your education. It controls your economics. It controls your electrical power distribution people. And that single button the government wants, they push it, you lose your electrical power. You cannot buy, sell, or trade. My time is up again for the old teacher. So, anyone wishing to discuss that later? I'm more than happy. <laughs> uh, I only have one question. Is, it, is this okay? You, um, Henry, you're obviously a very intelligent person. You've been here uh, since you retired. Uh, do you feel you've been involved in the, in the business community and other aspects of the county to adequately uh, have a, a good finger on the pulse of, of what this county is about to uh, be this county commissioner. So what you're asking me is, is uh, what I can contribute to the county, is that it, is it skill or whatever? What I'm trying to do is preserve the American dream of the next generation. The crowning glory of any culture, any civilization, is to leave the country in a better condition that you received it. I experienced the American dream. I had opportunity. I had, I could get funding. I could do everything. And what's happening in, in Oregon and in Jackson County is those opportunities are diminishing. The graduates of SOU, my daughter is a senior over there. But this academic year, she's in Taiwan, she's in Taipei. And she'll come back and graduate. Uh, I, I think that what I have to offer is of great benefit to Jackson County. And what you have to understand is regulations, where they start at the federal level, they work down to the state, they work down to the county, everything affects the county. Everything. I'm pro-agriculture, but I'm against GMO. And there's a reason. I'm pro-library, but I'm against the new tax initiative. I'm pro-education. I used to teach. How many in here, if you want to find out what the education system, the product they're turning out, how many in here can raise their hand and say they drove a school bus? I got 30 seconds. I did. Okay, excellent, excellent. More people should, and then you find out. Because you have to have these experiences to make judgment calls. And that's all that we're, we're doing. I'm, I'm just applying for a job in which I can make these judgment calls based on experience. It does affect the county. And the old professor here is almost out of time again. <laughs> and uh, so anyone wishing to discuss it further, I'm more than happy. <laughs> OK. Does that answer your question? Okay. Rick, do you have another question? Or Henry, do you have a question for Rick? You don't have any questions, so I'll defer I, to Rick. I, I came here as, as an information, Good. As, as an education, not to challenge anyone. OK. Uh, Joel, did you have a question for Colleen at all? Because we can move right into questions. We have a lot of questions this evening. Okay. We have multiple questions, and Colby, you're still going around with three by five cards if you'd like, or if you want to address in person. We'll have that ability in our second and our third portion of the evening. These questions are in uh, no particular order. And these are for all the candidates. So I'll start at that end. Colleen, this is for you. Some of you have mentioned owning a business. If elected, what will your role in the business be? And how will you balance that with your duties of a commissioner? Or will you step away from an active role in running the business? Colleen. Yes, I have been in business, and I am in business, worked all day today. <laughs> but as commissioner, um, I am committed to take that as my full-time job. Our business has been for sale. Sean and I have worked at firm decades, and we have a loving community and a, a most gracious um, citizen group that comes in, and, and we'll miss them a lot. But Sean is looking kind of go to missions, and uh, I keep getting drawn into politics. So, um, yeah, we are, we'll be 
doing something different, and I, it will be challenging. I have a lot of prayer for my church as we seek these new directions because we're both stepping out in faith, um, in service, to where God would have us to be. And I look forward to the challenge. Well, I'm a licensed real estate broker, and we have to maintain our licensure every two years. We have to maintain 30 hours of re-education. I'll continue to do that. I will continue to keep my license active. Uh, in most cases, or most likely, I'll be referring anything that might come uh, my direction. There may be instances where I do involve myself in real estate transactions, um, but my principal role will be as a county commissioner, and, uh, as, and again, uh, with my background in land use uh, planning, uh, Commissioner, uh, I think it will be very advantageous to uh, help change some of the comprehensive plans that I have some ideas for that will uh, directly go to a, an improved uh, policy making procedure. Henry? I am no longer in business, so I can devote full time to this position here. Again, the position is to educate the people. You have to make the decisions. We need to prepare for what's coming. And that is the basis of this whole campaign. That is what I bring. It's not divided. I'm not here for entertainment. I'm not here, as I said, I'm just a citizen politician. I'm just here temporarily. I used to have a philosophy professor, he'd say, you know, after I walk out of this class, you cannot conclusively prove that I ever existed. <laughs> That's the politician I am. Once I'm gone, I could just be a figment of your imagination. But I hope that I leave a legacy behind that makes life easier for everyone. That I hope I identify pitfalls that we need to address. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Rick. Again. I certainly intend to make uh, the position of Jackson County Commissioner my number one priority. And the neat thing is, in my business, I have several uh, people that, that work for me and have been with me a while. And it's, it's kind of a fun thing to think uh, of giving them the opportunity uh, to take over a more active role and hopefully grow it. Um, I would love to see that. And I have some capable people. Uh, that are eager to do that. I intend to keep my finger in it a little bit. Um, it's my baby, uh, but again, uh, my, my role as Jackson County Commissioner is certainly going to be number one priority, and I know it's more than a full-time position. Uh, in, in the past, as I've told you, I seem to uh, take on a lot, but I also take it as a challenge, and I, and I usually accomplish, so I'll, be, I'll be less Modest. I almost always accomplish what I set out for, uh, such as when I decided to go to law school. That was a tough task, tougher than I ever thought it would be. Uh, I saw it through. Uh, so as far as uh, handling the small amount uh, that I intend to be involved in the business and, and being a very active and productive and effective commissioner, I don't have any doubts that I, I'll be able to do that. Colleen, I'll ask you another question. This is for all candidates, and this uh, is on three by five card. It says, "What specific specific programs could you eliminate in order to bring prosperity back to Jackson County?" That's a good question. Prosperity is what we want, and it doesn't take government to make prosperity. It takes government to get out of the way. Um, there's so much. Our natural resources need to be open. Um, and like I addressed earlier, a uh, judge has ordered that to happen. And, it, and I think it will bring prosperity, that alone, that it has a multiplier effect. When men are working, um, crime goes down, families are supported, businesses are supported. It's, it's a great thing. Secondly, I see tons, and I was so glad you asked the question, tons of programs I would eliminate in a heartbeat. Uh, just this week, the commissioners passed in a state grant for in-home care for early childhood development. The state does not belong in our homes. And I will protect our citizens with all I have to keep the state out of our homes. 
um, there was a grant a couple years ago. I mean, just grants, grants come in. It drives me nuts. They, it was a ten. It was a ten thousand dollar grant to um, you know, uh, make sure everybody in Ashland had their shots. And I go, why are we spending our money that way? And they told me, well, that's not local money. That's federal money. It's my money too, and I will be the protector of that money in those programs. And by the by this um, by getting that out of there, we will have more money. We will be more free, and um, it'll be the things I will watch for. One of the other items is the um, is the uh, some restrictions that are being put on everything you do in this county. I think it really inhibits our prosperity. Can you name one thing we can do without a permit? Mm. I cannot, and I just think uh, we need to look those over. I have, I have. 2013 permit, ske permit schedule. It went up an average of 12% last year. Whose wages kept up with that? And system development charges went up 10% across the board. And I think those are definitely things I would look at to make us more prosperous. Joel, cool. specific programs would you eliminate in order to bring prosperity back to Jackson County? Well, the biggest issue is that we have a, an appeals process that is very onerous, and uh, it, it speaks to a number of opportunity loss. There's not a specific program that's assigned to that, but the problem is, is in Jackson County, we are the most appellant county in the state. We have a number of people who are very astute at watching what our overarching land use uh, laws are, and uh, it's easy to say or easy to throw out platitudes that you're going to try to improve uh, prosperity by wishing or wanting that you can remove some of these things, but they are very complex. They require negotiation among competing parties and competing interests, and it requires somebody that can bring people together of disparate interests, and I've been doing that for a number of years on the Planning Commission. I did it in my business life. There's no specific programs that I would outline that we want to uh, remove, but uh, watching uh, and making sure that the systems of those programs are efficient is the most important way to bring the additional prosperity. Uh, relative to the uh, ONC lands, uh, naturally we all want to get back into there. We can see that it's taken four years just to try to get either the Walden or the Wyden bills put together. It is very complex, it's very difficult, and uh, we're looking forward I hope to being able to, to get back in there. I have sent a letter to the BLM recommending that they take emergency actions on burn areas so that we can get in and salvage timber before we lose that wood fiber and also it will uh, provide for better recovery of the forest lands so it will impact not only the benefit to the timber itself but to the economy of the county. Henry. The question is this, what specific programs could you, or would you, excuse me, would you eliminate in order to bring prosperity back to Jackson County? Well, any question. There is no simple answer. There is no bullet, silver bullet for the answer for this. My answer is not a program I would eliminate, but what programs you would support. A program for cheap energy. If we're going to bring back manufacturing, you need cheap energy. You need a program, you need a plan for water. We need water bought for land use, for agriculture, for industry. So where are you going to get this? Well, you have to revert back to engineers and business people, people who are dreamers, people who with opportunity and resources turn dreams into reality. The program that would affect Jackson County the most, is you wouldn't even implement here. It would be at the federal level. Do you realize? that as soon as they discovered the isotope helium-3 on the moon, we canceled our space program. Helium-3 has been known for 40 years to be the ideal fusion fuel. It's non-toxic. The byproducts are non-toxic. But there's no helium-3 on the face of the Earth except one cubic foot that has been reclaimed from demilitarized weapons, nuclear weapons, in 30 seconds. I can't complete the, this program, but we need to start addressing far-ranging. We have to look ahead, years ahead. 
We have to implement that now. When I'm gone, someone else picks up the baton and runs with it. With that, nuclear energy. And in 10 seconds, I'm out of time again. So anyone wishing to discuss helium-3 and fusion and the possibilities, I'll be more than happy to do that. I would like to fire your imagination and get you interested in it. That is the answer. Rick. I don't necessarily have a specific program I could say I would cut, but I think it's important to look at every program and say, is it necessary, is it effective, and, and most of all, is it affordable? Uh, and I cringe at the, uh, the idea at various levels of government, well, if it's not county money, then it's free money. Well, it's not free money. It's all taxpayer money, and it needs to be, it needs to be uh, treated the same. So, again, as a constant process, I think every program that we offer and every expenditure that is made needs to be evaluated on is it necessary, is it effective, and is it affordable? And I don't think there are any sacred cows uh, necessarily that if they don't meet that criteria, that they shouldn't be looked at very closely. Thank you, Mayor. I'll bring another question for Colleen as we're continuing. This is, would you consider nullifying land use planning as directed by the state of Oregon? Why or why not? Boy, land use planning is a is a tough one in our state. It's crippled us. It's affected our prosperity. It's affected businesses, and I don't know which is worse, Senate Bill 100 or that regional problem solving uh, program. They are very controlling of what we can do with our property, and um, I would I would hope I, I look at um, what happens in Portland. And those same uh, controls are, are on us down here in Jackson County. We have a whole different environment here. It doesn't fit us. And um, I don't know, I, I would really lobby to get our own local control and our own uh, capabilities of, mo of, of leading and governing ourselves uh, within our state, but our Senate Bill 100, I don't know if we can get, if we can get our conservative governor in there, if we can make a difference and take our state back for our prosperity, for our businesses, for our land use and our freedom and our liberty, but it is very crippled. I think the only thing we can do with Senate Bill 100, we sure can't make less restrictions than it, but we can make more, and it exactly seems as what we're doing. And um, nullifying it would be a great start. I am a fighter. I'm not just a watchdog. Um, my opponent wants to be a watchdog. It has been over the planning. We need an attack dog. We need someone to take back our rights, our freedom, our liberty, and our, our ability to do what we can with our property and building and, and be prosperous again. Thank you. Joel. Well, I'm also on the uh, Governor's Executive Order 1207, which we call SORP, the Southern Oregon Regional Pilot Plan, and what that is proposed to do and what we are working towards is again more local autonomy to uh, divert from what the state land use to, uh, planning requirements uh, have for the entire state. We do have different geography down here. It is being recognized. We have to agree with another county in order to be able to go forward for us to, to uh, get away from what the, uh, the overarching 19 statewide planning goals that were created by Senate Bill 100 back in 1974. It is only the legislature that would be able to make those changes along with a responsive uh, governor. I will work with our legislators to provide them with a lot of good information. One of the biggest issues of, that we have down here is again because we have uh, such an appellant uh, rich environment here, you can't simply say I will work to get rid of that because it won't occur. You have to work through the issues with these competing interests and move this ball forward. And I've called it always a game of yards one by inches. And I have been more than just a watchdog. I have personally affected improvement. I've watched to make sure that the right words were included 
like the word shall instead of the word might or will and so forth, so that the, the correct intent of what the laws and the rules have uh, allowed for us, and I view, by the way, our laws and our rules as allowances, not restrictions. And also, back in 2010, we made a policy in uh, Jackson County that we would not be more restrictive in land use than what the state requires. So any ordinance that comes in that is imposing more restrictions on our county, and there's an ordinance on the ballot this coming up that would do that, violates the policy that the board said back in 2010 that we wouldn't be more restrictive than what the state imposes on us. And I've been working uh, for the last nine years to make sure that we have more, more of our own local autonomy down here. Thank you. Henry? The question is, would you consider nullifying land use planning as directed by the state of Oregon? Why or why not? What you have to realize is, in government, the way they approach things, you dazzle them with BS or you stonewall them with due process. And that's what you're looking at, people. How would I approach it? God. You'd resist it to the point of going to jail. You, you, would, you would take control, and you know what's going to happen. In this country, it's based on the principle of the sacrifice of a few for the benefit of the many who don't care. Most people don't care about land use. I do. I'm interested in agriculture. I'm interested in housing. I'm interested in all kinds of things. But we've adopted the Shanghai housing concept. That means that's why you see the, the, the diminished permits that are issued for freestanding private homes. The Shanghai housing concept, have you seen it? You take I-5 north towards Portland, as you approach the medical center where the tram crosses I-5, look off to your right and you'll see these buildings rising out of the, the river mud. It has a, a, a ratio of about 36 to 1. You take the footprint of the building, build it 36 times high. If you come from the farm, it reminds you of a brooder house where you put baby chickens in racks. I don't like that. Some people do, but land use involves more than just subdivision. It's how you're going to use it, and that is controlled by the permit process. Are you willing to take a risk? I am. And if I falter, is there anyone here who will pick up the baton and take my place? I don't know about that. So land use involves more than just subdivision or talking about timber or talking about these other things. So what would I do? Again, it's education. That's what I bring, the diversity that I, I would bring to this board. Okay, thank you. Rick? Well, I'm all for local control and autonomy in, in just about every area of government. We're obviously a much different animal than, than what they are up north. Uh, I think that needs to be acknowledged. Um, and as far as land use goes, we just need reason, the allowing of a reasonable use, uh, and reasonable in quotes, not what, not what uh, seems to be considered reasonable now, uh, but we need to do um, what we need to do to entice investment, uh, hiring, uh, and just, again, uh, growth, economic growth in this area. And whether that's at the local level, the state level, uh, wherever it comes from, it needs to be revamped and, and looked at again in a, in a truly reasonable manner and not what's been uh, the, the status quo lately. Excellent. Thank you, Rick. This next question is for all the candidates. I'll start with Joel. And I'm combining two questions that came in. They're basically the same. Speaking about the county resident put in jail uh, for collecting rainwater on his own property in his own pond, how would you defend his property rights or not? Well, the first thing about defending anybody is understanding all of the facts of the case. And in the state of Oregon, the State Department of Water Resources controls the use and retention of water. 
in my real estate business over the past uh, now nearly 10 years. I've done a lot of work with uh, water consultants helping people receive water rights on their pro property, making sure that their water rights were active, making sure that they were using being used in beneficial use, making sure that there were no claims on them, and making sure that those who were doing impoundments had the appropriate certifications and proof surveyed right. People can get those rights to get uh, retain water, but when you're given a right for a certain amount of acre feet of storage, that's the requirement that you have. Everybody's entitled and free to violate those rights. But when you do violate those rights, they come with consequences. If you're given a right to store one acre foot of water, but you end up building a pond that stores five acre feet of water, you violated the right. Now, to change that right, again, it goes back to getting a, a legislature together and a responsive governor to change the laws relative to water use and retention. Those things I'm a proponent for. I see nothing wrong with the ability to retain water in an impoundment, but if it requires a certification, you need to abide by what you were certified to do. So in defending someone who went to jail for an alleged violation, I would look at all the facts and make a decision based on a reasoned evaluation of what the facts are. And also I know that there was some other extenuating circumstances in that particular case that there was some uh, um, incarceration due to a violation of a court order in addition to just the impoundment issue. Excellent. Henry, I'd like to call on you next for that question. Your comments on the gentleman that was put in jail three times related to collecting rainwater on his property and his pond how would you defend his property rights or not? Again, I come from an agricultural background in Texas. Rainwater is considered your property. It's yours, and it can only be taken away if you allow it. As the gentleman said, there's consequences for doing that. But I, as a commissioner, support the, uh, support the gentleman? Yes. Would I commit resources of the county to defending that gentleman? Yes. We're talking about the principle of collecting rainwater, not the fact that he may be an infraction of some other law, but we're talking about the rainwater. That's what's important here. And yes, we need to stand up and, and, and you, you take that back. And the only way you can take it back is there's risk involved in it. It's to say no. And they say, we're going to sue you. We're going to take you to court. And you go, okay. How long do you want to drag this out? In the meantime, it will be publicized. In the meantime, people will be educated. In the meantime, hopefully there will be a landslide in, of support. And the pol political system changes. But to change the political system, you have to take a risk. You have to step forward. Do you hear anyone uh, criticizing the Canadian health care system? No, because it is... You can go to prison for criticizing that. The rules are changing where you can't criticize. Right now you can. And I would support the collection of rainwater that is your property that belongs to you. It doesn't belong to the state. But you're going to have to put yourself out and take a risk and say no. You're going to have to go to these boards and go, what in the hell are you guys doing? Nobody does. I'm almost out of time again. Anyone wishing to discuss that issue? I'll stay after class. Thank you. Rick, as well, related to the uh, county resident that was in jail, in prison three times for storing water on his property. Well, I'll be honest, I don't know all the facts uh, involving this, this situation, but on its face, it appears to be unbelievably overzealous uh, enforcement and prosecution and, and that type of behavior and that type of action uh, obviously uh, can't be tolerated. Um, and as far as uh, the rainwater, uh, you know, I'm, I'm of the opinion too that uh, that should belong to the homeowner and, and he should be able to utilize it. Uh, it seems again to me uh, like overregulation, overzealous enforcement, uh, and it, um, again, without knowing the facts, it sounds like they're 
there probably was some other issues at play there that uh, caused there to be some sort of a personal conflict. So uh, I don't know all of those facts, but uh, on its face, it's, it's certainly infuriating and it needs to be addressed. Thank you, Rick. I've got a, a three-part question. And you didn't. Oh, excuse me so much. Ms. Colleen, go right ahead. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thanks for watching, everyone. <laughs> yes, Gary Harrington went to jail. Not just to jail, he was in solitary confinement. And yeah, it was water on his property, as pond water. And he's still fighting it. And who of us are willing to go to jail for our rights? I applaud him. And do you know what happened when he was in jail? Yeah, gay for Gary. <laughs> you know what happened at a commissioner meeting while he was in jail? Our commissioners gave Oregon Water Resources Department office space. I wouldn't have done that as a commissioner either. I think we need to stand for our citizens. I will stand for you. I'll stand for your rights and our constitutional freedom to own property, to own water. Those ponds are empty. It's fire season. Uh, we have a pond. It's not equally enforced. We don't have a permit on our pond. There's ponds all in his neighbors. That's what people in the country do to fight fires and to live safe and to live responsibly on their, on their land. And um, it's a shame what our state's done and our county has just been a watchdog over it. We need fighters. Next question, uh, I'll, Rick, I'll direct this to you. You have uh, two minutes. It is a three-part uh, answer related to the county ballot measures coming up in May, the banning of GMOs or the GMO, uh, this is measure 15-119, uh, uh, forming an official library district and forming an extension service district. So. Careful with your time on that. Uh, as far as the, the GMO measure goes, um, I, I believe that the, the core issue, uh, reasonable minds can still disagree. Um, as far as the ordinance goes, I've read it several times. Um, it is vague. It is difficult to, to ascertain as a reasonable, the standard is, a reasonable person must be able to understand what is being proscribed and who it pertains to. Uh, it's it's for challenges in that area, challenges that the county would have to defend. Uh, on top of that, enforcement, abatement, uh, and again, defending other challenges, I don't believe our county has the luxury to be able to write that blank check right now. Um, on the other issues, uh, the library, again, here we are in the library. Libraries are a wonderful institution. Um, I, would, I want to see them uh, retained, uh, obviously, as much as anybody. I also, in my business, um, I'm in folks' homes all the time, and I know up to 60 cents millage can be a, a, a real difficult thing for a lot of families and individuals on fixed income to swallow. Um, I will get behind whatever the, the voters decide on that, as well as the GMO. Uh, personally, I think there's too many folks that probably would not be able to afford up to a 60 cents millage. Uh, as far as the, uh, the OSU extension, uh, there are some extremely valuable uh, services and programs that I just don't, no matter what happens, I think we need to retain them. 4-H just develops some unbelievably great individuals, teaches them a lot of great lessons, uh, are, are emerging and, and blossoming uh, wine industry in the valley has benefited from some of the extension service services uh, and all their services are, are extremely valuable and I think uh, again if that does not pass uh, I believe there's some some private funding to be had there and some some creative ways to make sure that we retain those services uh, somehow and that would be my goal thank you Rick uh, Henry I'd like to address that question it's a three-part related Brother, to the measures. I already guessed. I won't vote on that. No on GMO. <coughs> no on the tax initiative. I love libraries. I use them three days a week. It's great. But I think the county has a historical obligation to fund and operate those. 
So now we're back to the issue, you know, what programs would you delete to make the county prosperous again? Well, we'll have to look into that because I feel the libraries need to be funded, okay? The other tax, I, I, I don't believe in any of these issues in which we expand the role of government. We, we create new tiers, new layers of government. We have enough. And you know something? It's reached a point, like in Jackson County, at one time you go back 15 years ago, industry was here. There was a lot of industry and the tax balance, that supported by profit from industry and the tax supported by appropriations from the homeowner, the property owner, et cetera, et cetera. Those ratios have changed. Industry has dissipated. And now it goes more on the shoulder of these people. It's becoming tighter. And what this translates into is every time we incrementally increase the taxes, someone's home gets foreclosed on. And the bottom line is the library is not worth one person losing their home in light of the fact that the county is obligated to support that. You have waiting, you already, you have waiting in the wings, tax measures coming that's going to increase the cost of living. That mileage tax, you think that went away in Salem? Oh, no, 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 it's still there. You think that reformulating uh, the income tax system has gone away? Oh, no, 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 it's still waiting in the wings. I'm down to 10 seconds, and we can discuss that after class, too. Okay. <coughs> Sure. Back when they were forming the Constitution, there used to be a saying that let's uh, talk a little treason and drink a little beer, and unfortunately we don't have any beer here, but um, <laughs> regarding GMO, my concern about that is that if that measure passes, it will lead to an unfunded mandate. The county does not have the resources that uh, we would want to allocate to manage that process. That thing is modeled after another ordinance that we have to protect against fire, blight, and disease in pear orchards. That program, those determinations are made by the Department of Agriculture. This GMO uh, ban would require that the, the county itself be the only county in the state that would have a different set of rules based on how you uh, grow your crops, how the agricultural community works together. It would be, I think, a very tearing in the fabric of our agricultural community. And there's no question in my mind that it's going to cost the county residents a lot of money. By litigation alone, I'm sure that there will be lawsuits, probably one way or the other now, because it made the ballot. And it will cost money. It already it's, it has cost some money just in allocating funds to review what the requirements will be to try to meet this unfunded mandate in order to uh, apply the code and the ordinances. Um, relative to the libraries, you know, we have uh, 15 libraries. I didn't vote for those originally. I thought maybe we could probably get by with much fewer than that. However, they are there. They exist. There are no cities that want to take them on because they have no need to do that. They can't be utilized for anything else until 2020. Uh, we uh, have, I think, a great need for further education, especially out in the rural communities where people can uh, aggregate and socialize and have access to information and books. I think they're a good thing. I am not generally as a Republican for taxes, but I can certainly see the justification for that measure to go forward and allow the libraries to function until we can move them into uh, other ownerships later on. And lastly, relative to the uh, OSU and 4-H, that is a nickel, a thousand. 4-H is extremely important for the younger generation in our community. I always had acreage. Our kids were always able to enjoy animals on our own. But there are a lot of kids that learn a lot of good responsibility having access to 4-H and 4-H projects and work with families. Oh, Time. sorry. Thank you. Colleen. Well, first I want to speak about the budget because the two ballot measures for the libraries, the extension, are budgetary matters. Um, they're there because our uh, county commissioners put them there. Um, they weren't a citizen initiative. They were worked on probably by their support committees, but um, the, with the stroke of the pen, the commissioners put them on there. 
Um, I am for libraries. I am for extension. I believe we need to budget those with the money we've already given the county to operate in. Uh, if you look at this year's budget process, uh, when I look at the county numbers, the, the libraries, for example, the revenue is only down $20,000. They had they re restored almost all their funding with the extra money that came in with their supplemental budget. They, uh, they can do that. Budgeting is daunting. And, you know, they can do it. They can prioritize. When you look at their choices they made over the extension, I believe the only amount of money that they gave the extension was about $204,000 for the year. And yet we paid, we bought out a contract at the expo for, for more than that, and for an investment. I think it's priorities, and we can fund our extension. And 4-H is very important. My kids all went through 4-H. It's, it's a lot of teaching skills and great for our rural kids and city kids as well. But I am not for more taxes. I am not. I will vote no myself. I will, however, if it's up to those people to vote, I will support their vote. If they vote them in, uh, we'll go with that. As far as GMOs go, it is definitely heated on both sides. Um, I see our food sovereignty, sovereignty very much at risk. I see Monsanto just last year becoming a member of the UN Agenda 21. That's got a red flag all over it for me. Um, I will probably be voting no, but again, it's up for vote yes means no on that one for removing GMOs. And our, our uh, county administrator said six times in the meeting it may cost nothing. Uh, he investigated the costs, and um, I know we have citizens that just with a $10,000 a day cease and desist got to quit doing what they're doing on their property. I think they've got the power in place. Um, but yeah, it'll be up to the citizens, and I will back what they vote for on that as well. It'll take common sense leadership, no matter how the ballot goes. Thank you. Time's up. Our next question is uh, directed to our, all the candidates, of course. It says, how will you, as county commissioner, work with the sheriff of Jackson County to fully exercise the constitutional powers on behalf of county residents? And Henry, I'll call on you to start. How would I read that question again? How would you, as county commissioner, work with the sheriff of Jackson County to fully exercise the constitutional powers on behalf of the county residents? If we go back to my past experience in government, I was always very close to the law enforcement agencies. Most of my buddies in the county where I work were law enforcement officers. For 10 years, I worked for General Services Agency and I was assigned to the jails and prisons. The county would like for me to quit. They didn't realize people were a hobby of mine and I liked it there. It took them 10 years to realize that. I've always had a close cooperative effort with the sheriff's office and with law enforcement. As I, as, again, there's, there's questions that come up and they'll say, well, because law enforcement is associated with the jails. And so there's questions about the jails. And I say, well, before we can address anything, we have to define what they are. First of all, they're job security for a lot of people. Do you want to mess with that? And then now we get down to the inmates. It's why they're in there. Do you realize some people that are in jail are millionaires and they're there by choice? That's surprising, isn't it? My studies show three, per six, three to six percent are in there for something they didn't even do. They were in the wrong place at the wrong time. They don't have any influence in the community. They don't have any money. And it's easy to plead guilty to some crime rather than spend 15 years in prison. So they're offered a deal. You know, eight months in jail, or you're looking at 15 to life if you lose. Someone's bearing fault witness. You can't fight that. So they're in jail for something they didn't do. Now some are in jail for something they didn't do, but they did something else. Some people are in jail. There was a man in this jail I was in who had been sentenced to the streets for one year. That was his prison sentence. He loved the jail. He had business cards, 701 South Abel Street, Mill Peters, California. So one year, the judge sentenced him to one year on the streets. And you know, he said that was the worst, the, the longest year of my life. Henry, you're so over. I'm out of time, and I'm over. I, 
Thank you. I I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> okay. Joel, how will you, as county commissioner, work with the sheriff of Jackson County to fully exercise the constitutional powers on behalf of county residents? Well, naturally, I'm a strong supporter of uh, public safety, and uh, I know that we uh, have a very good uh, sheriff's department in our county. Uh, naturally, I'll uh, work with to the fullest extent of their constitutional authorities and not exceed those authorities in a nonsensical fashion. So I think, uh, I think our current sheriff and likely uh, uh, going forward, our sheriff's department uh, has a pretty good bead on what their constitutional uh, latitudes are and uh, I'll certainly work with them to preserve those. Colleen. Um, public safety is important. Um, our sheriff's budget is just down slightly and, and well funded by our county and supported. I came to the sheriff's forum, it was just like this, and all the candidates said they would uphold the Constitution and, and I would support them entirely. I think the Constitutional Sheriff's Association offers great training to for the public health and safety and welfare of, of the citizens by the commissioners and the sheriff working together to maintain our Second Amendment rights and our Fourth Amendment rights and our Tenth Amendment rights. And um, I believe heartily in our constitutional rights and standing for them, knowing what they are, and being on board with our sheriff to ensure that they are fully um, protecting our citizens. Thank you. Rick? Well, I am certainly a big believer in every constitutional right that's afforded every American citizen, and I will enlist any agency within my control to ensure that they are uh, enforced, uh, that they're not violated. Um, that goes, you know, for, for some, uh, especially the ones that are under fire right now, uh, strongly support, uh, again, upholding and making sure we enlist whatever help is necessary, whatever agencies are within our control, to make sure that they are preserved. Uh, it's extremely important, and it's something that is definitely under fire right now, and I am very well aware of that. Uh, and I believe we had some brilliant uh, forefathers that put forth a brilliant document that does not be, need to be construed uh, so liberally that it basically has no meaning, and that is, seems to be what's happening right now. And again, at the county level, I'll do whatever is in my control. Excellent. Thank you. We have a question related to BLM land and camp confiscating cattle. And the question is, this past weekend, agents of the BLM confiscated cattle belonging to the Bundy family of Nevada. This was their resolution to a dispute over grazing rights on public lands managed by the BLM. What will you do to take back control of public lands? from federal and state government agencies that are not elected and act as if they own this land that belongs to Jackson County and is only administered by the Forest Service and BLM. Colleen? Did you get all of that okay? Yeah, I gotta okay. get me a gun. <laughs> no, um, yeah, our sheriff is the top uh, law of the land, and I saw those in Enemy of the State programs on uh, Fox News this weekend, and they have a battle, and we have a battle, and Sheriff Winters, you'd go out there with me, wouldn't you? <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's what I told him in the interview. I said, you know, when, when the federal government had their sequester, I drive a long ways home. I live in Prospect. There was no less than five locked gates on public lands. I called Commissioner Asher. I said, what's the matter with my gates being locked on my lands? He said, well, we're in sequester. I said, I'd go get my sheriff. I said, let's get those roads open. That's public safety. That's fire precaution. Those are our lands. And it starts small. But I think we need to, to know we have our sheriff. We have our constitutional rights. And yes, they are non-elected organizations telling us what we're doing on our, on our land. And uh, it's coming quickly. I, I see that when I see, I've been watching government, and um, we need to stand up, and we need to be as brave as that Gary Harrington, and be bold for our freedoms, too. And, and if I'm elected, I'm not going along. You guys have to come with me, because it's not a one-man job. Uh, it's a, empowered by the people. We're a government for, of, and by the people, and, and that's what I run on. So I just... I think we, those BLM lands, I applaud those guys and in Nevada. They took back some of their cattle. They have a fight. We need that fight. 
We don't need just just to get along. We need to have a fight. It's out there and it's it's coming in on us quick. And so I would sure take back our lands too. All right. Joel. Okay. Uh, once again, I'll work with our legislators as well as our uh, U.S. Uh, representatives and Senate to get better utilization out of the BLM. And, uh, and uh, forest service lands that we have in our area. Library library uh, <laughs> five minutes. We got five minutes. Uh, so and that's what I intend to do. Uh, I've heard a lot of talk about picking a lot of fights. Fights are expensive. Fights are going to cost money. Fights are going to cost taxpayer dollars. I hope you're all prepared for that if that's the direction you went ahead. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm looking forward as a commissioner to have more, better local control of our uh, resources in this area, but by building bridges, not by burning them. Okay. Henry? The follow-up on that, this is the weekend related to the BLM confiscating cattle off of lands. And what would you do to take back control of public lands from federal and state government agencies that are not elected and act as if they own the land that belongs to Jackson County and is only administered by the Forest Service and BLM? First thing you do is what they did. You have to stand up, and it's risky, but you have to stand take a chance. Again, what is important to Jackson County, the answers don't lie here. They lie somewhere else, and you have to address that. The federal government has been confiscating more than cattle. The post office has been confiscating cash. The, uh, uh, the DEA has been confiscating more than drugs. It's published in any large uh, publications such as the Wall Street Journal, you'll see all these government agencies, and you'll find the cattle there if the BLM actually took them. Again, what, what's been discussed here is at what level do you decide to say no? What level, what expense are you willing to spend? Personally, I would challenge it. Personally, I would stand up and take the risk. Personally, I would commit county resources defending the citizens here. You don't know what the final cost is. But you're reaching a point in time in the evolution of this country that you're almost back to the point where only 25% of the people supported the, re the revolution itself. 25% were wanted to stay with the king and 50% just didn't care. So how many people here care? Yes, I would support committing resources of the county to defending people who have been wronged in this county. That's the end of the subject. Oh. I, I, I carry with me a document published by the Daughters of the American Revolution, and it talks about all the people who signed the Declaration of Independence and what happened to them. They were flown into debtor's prison at the end of the war for contributing to the cause. They suffered heavily. And we're back almost to that point that we have to almost do the same thing to preserve what's here. Henry, you're out of time again. After class, anyone? <laughs> Rick? <coughs> Related to the BLM confiscation of lands, and what would you do to take back control of public lands from federal and state officers? It's a, it's a battle that needs to be fought on, on many fronts. Every front we can possibly find a battle to fight it. Uh, in the courts, lobbying uh, in Washington, just a united front here in our county, um, and, and it is something that people need to care about and get involved with. Uh, and that's, again, uh, like, like any issue. Uh, we need to come together. Uh, I think we all have the common goal there. Uh, just sometimes we have different ways of getting to it. Uh, and again, a united front in this county. I, I, obviously, these things cannot continue to occur, and we need to fight it on every front we can possibly find uh, to, to change it. Okay, thank you, Rick. In about five minutes, I want to take questions from the audience who haven't filled out cards. Can I get a show of hands of who wants to ask a verbal question? Two, three, four. Okay. 
We're fighting time. We're going to give the uh, candidates five minutes for their closing statement. So I want to squeeze in as many questions as we can in the next 10 minutes. Uh, Colby, I guess maybe grab a, a Craig? cordless mic. Maybe they could just stand up. I wouldn't worry about it. Okay, the mics, yeah. I don't want to eat up any time with that. That might be the one that doesn't function. The uh, last question, these are questions that were emailed in that could not be here tonight that as asked. And uh, uh, what are your feelings on Common Core or the dumbing down of America? A lot we're going to do here in the county on Common Core, aren't we? So between uh, Common Core and uh, education, I'd like to hear your comments on education in the state of Oregon along with Common Core. And uh, Colleen, would you like to take that? I think they've succeeded. Uh, Common Core is, um, is pushing in on our schools. I, that was the battle I had before I started county work. I was in there with the schools and that's where we need to be. We need to be on school boards and um, making some impact on the curriculum. It's pretty much set in stone. I don't know how you get textbooks changed to actually have history and our constitutional teaching, um, but we need to be involved and it takes us all stepping up to do that. Um, my kids are out of school, so and then my kids homeschool, so um, it is definitely their avenue they took to fight Common Core is just get them out of there. It's pretty dangerous. It's definitely, I believe, part of the, uh, again, the UN Agenda 21 plan and we have to fight like the like Rick said on so many levels there's so much being when they take our kids and they've got in-home care for by the state and they're going to take them to school and there's several programs even regional programs they have in our county that we've passed contracts with the state to ensure every child goes to school ready to learn and my question to commissioners and so what is that you buying each a book or a computer no answer but it was the open door to a regional program that um, involves early childhood education and I just that's where it's starting I mean we're fighting it at the county level but um, we need to be aware of what's going on in our kids schools and deprogram it every night. That's what I did with my kids. Even years ago when they attended, we spent all evening talking about what they learned. And it's a battle, and it's it's worth it. You just can't give up. Thank you. Joel? Well, as a free market, enterprise-driven Republican, I am for competition in education as well. And so naturally, I am for charter schools as an alternative to public education. Uh, we sent our children to, uh, as I said, to a private school. We made our sacrifices in order to do that because we wanted to have uh, more authority with how they were being educated, and they came away with extremely good educations. We recognize that everybody can't do that, or maybe they choose not to do that, but homeschooling is one other alternative to that. And the more competitive we are with the public uh, education system, the more likely they are to listen to the market and the market is the way that uh, those things should be driven as well as in most other cases. Henry? You've stepped into a, a subject I could go on for many hours. Regulations. Again, that is what's influencing the schools. The teachers, I drove up when we had the strike here, I drove up and down Biddle Road several times. I was looking for teachers. I was having a hard time defining where they were. I know that enrollment's increased about 20%, but employment has gone up 100% in the schools. That's a problem. What I saw was a lot of employees. What I saw, I know there's teachers out there, but they're afraid to speak up. They should have been protesting those curriculums that they are enforced to uh, administer, but they weren't because they're afraid of their jobs, and that's understandable. Now, I used to teach for San Jose Unified School District. But you understand, they solicited me, I, not them, and so my, I had a rebuttal every week. Gee, I was supposed to teach this class, and it was an experimental class in which everyone was graded against themselves, not in competition with other kids. And I had a classroom full of what were profiled as slackers, uh, dropouts, whatever. 
And I know what they wanted me to give them good grades. But you know, it turned out to go the other way around. I stepped out. First day in school. I knew if I didn't survive the first day, no need coming back. I got 30 seconds. I walked into the classroom with my old Air Force jumpsuit on, spit shine boots, and a log chain around my neck, and I ran through the push bars on the doors. You know, I had control of my class. I just took control. But how many teachers can do that? What is your risk? Your career, your certification. I was uh, accused of counseling without a license. I'm a teacher, and I'm going to be prosecuted for counseling without a license. And all I'm doing is just listening to the kids that have all been profiled. More on the subject if you're interested. I'm out of time. Thanks, Henry. Rick, what are your feelings on Common Core or the dumbing down of America related to uh, education? Well, this is a frustration for me. I have a 10-year-old son, as, as I've told you, and one of the smartest kids, also one of the most handsome athletic, and I'll, I'll talk about that after class two. But I spend every night with him, uh, going over the, the homework that he has, uh, explaining it how they think it should be done, and then I explain how I really think it should be done. And uh, he picks it up pretty well, and, and I think that the key is just parental involvement, I believe. Charter schools are a good alternative. It, it does create competition, and right now there is no competition. Uh, unless you have the resources to spend whatever a private school might cost now. I haven't even looked into it because I know I can't. So my private school is me spending time with my son. Um, and again, I know that's a luxury that not every parent has, but I think that's the most important thing in educating our kids is just being involved. Uh, and that's, that's uh, again, what I do. Um, and, and I wish more parents would do the same with the time that they do have. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna take four uh, questions from the audience. And I saw someone's hand up over here. This gentleman, I think, who else had their hand up? These two gentlemen here and two over here. Okay, so I'd like to, uh, we'll keep it at two minutes, but if you can go to a minute, I would appreciate it from the candidates. Go ahead, sir. State your name and. Oh, it's working? Oh. It's off. Okay, it's not working. Um, I heard that the governor's plan is to have, by 2020, have everybody in Oregon live within 10 miles of the I-5 corridor. And they're starting to build uh, high-rise buildings. Uh, you mentioned it. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Okozi how he feels about high-rise buildings on 900 acres in East Medford. Um, that's an issue, I guess, in the last three or four weeks has been addressed. Uh, number two, what about Agenda 21? Are you guys going to fight Agenda 21 or are you going to cave into the United Nations? Joel, you could address the local issue. I don't know if we could address the UN related to uh, Agenda 21 as much as we'd like to. We're relegated to dealing with Senate Bill 100 primarily. Uh, Senate Bill 100 came into effect in 1974. The Kyoto Protocols became effective in 1994. They may have even taken some lead from Oregon land use laws. I'm more concentrating on what we can do with Oregon and dealing with the, the statewide planning goals that were brought forward with Senate Bill 100. And I can tell you they are complex. They are not going to go away by simple platitudes or by fighting the good fight. It requires an understanding of the complexities in dealing with those people that have competing interests and coming to reasonable conclusions and moving it forward in the direction that will benefit the best protection for private property rights, the best utilization of property, and so forth. The issue about 900 acres in, in East Medford and high rises has to do with uh, the simple fact that because of regional problem solving, the city is able to take a longer look and a more proactive look and a more local look at the lands that they might want to expand into. It's not automatic that they're going to do anything in particular, but they are given the latitude 
in deference to the other overarching and overreaching state land use requirements upon them. So it's actually a benefit for them to be able to look at lands and that again went over a 12 year time frame of noticing the public, public input in the entire time that I was involved in the review of that. It took almost two years and uh, there were 2,200 pages that I read every single page on. We made our recommendations. Nothing is absolutely perfect. There are allowances for 10-year re ten reviews in the RPS, but it does provide for accommodating growth in a meaningful way that allows for people to enjoy their properties. So it's a matter of, of working within a process that benefits everybody and accommodates the competing interests. Thanks, Joel. We had uh, one of the other gentlemen over on the far side with the hat. Could you stand up and ask your question so everyone can hear? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I have a question for everybody on the board. We have a county administrator. His name is Danny Jordan. It's no, uh, no secret here. And uh, he has incredible amount of control and power in the running of this county. As a matter of fact, he makes more money than uh, most uh, most you and me put together, and uh, with loan guarantees on homes and uh, loans on buying cars, and all because he quote unquote makes the county money. Now I'd like to know, being that he's a unelected uh, not even a representative, the people have no recourse. We can't recall him. We can't throw him out. He signs a contract with the commissioners, and his, his deal is sealed in gold. And uh, I think this is an abomination. It doesn't represent the people. And uh, I would not vote for any commissioner who uh, supports having a county administrator with such powers. So, so I'd like to hear your, what everybody thinks about Your question to the candidates? I'd like to hear what, if they... I like to hear what everybody thinks about uh, having a county administrator who's making twice as much money, three times as much money as the average citizen in Jackson County right now. Five times. Oh boy. Colleen, go ahead. <laughs> we go every week and ask him to take an oath of office. <laughs> it's been denied. And as commissioner, I think we need to go over that contract. Um, it, he has a lot of power. He is able to act as a, as a commissioner without a quorum. He has ability to make $5 million contracts. His, his authority was discussed at a public hearing last week at the commissioner's meeting, and they didn't discuss that. Apparently, that's a board order, so apparently it's something that can be um, changed. But his um, authority was discussed in the meeting. Um, I believe, I believe our commissioners make too much money. I objected in 2008 when they took a 28% increase. And they make, if the average citizen is making $35,000, they make it three times more than the people they represent. And I have I've committed, last time I ran, I commit this time, I will take that 2008 pay, which is ample enough. It's still way double of what the average citizen makes in this county. And um, I think when the cuts, you want to know what programs you cut? I think we should cut those elected officials making the money they make when our economy is suffering like it is. And yeah, I think our administrator, I would, I would like to look over. Apparently it's reviewed every year, his contract now. And I don't know how you pull a um, claim on a home loan. I don't know why he couldn't get a bank loan. I would think he made enough to qualify for bank loan. But... Um, yeah, I agree with you, Stuart, and, and I'm with you. I think we need to look over those things for the citizens. I listen to you, and, and I hear that comment a lot. And I think you need to be the, at the commissioner meeting and saying those things. It's intimidating. They're way up there high. But it's our government. It's for, for the people, of the people, and by the people. Go air your concerns without any recourse. They, you know, the organization of our county says the citizens of Jackson County are at the top of our county. The commissioners work for us. And we need to restore that order of organization in Jackson County. I tend to do that. Joel. We have a home rule charter that was uh, put into effect in, uh, on January 8th of 1979. 
It calls for the county commissioners to be the elected heads of the government of uh, Jackson County and also to provide, provide for the administration delegation as they so see fit. Any administrator works at the... Pull it uh, up a little bit. Yeah, there you go. Any administrator works at the pleasure of the commissioners. Now, in private business, I've always felt that a lack of experience costs more than someone who has the experience and ability. I would rather pay somebody $200,000 that makes me $20 million than pay somebody $50,000 that loses me $20 million. One of the reasons we're in such good shape in this county, relatively speaking, is because we have had good oversight generally by the boards that precede us and that we also now have a fund available to us to work through our rainy day periods, which we are in now. So uh, if there was no Danny Jordan, we would be looking for somebody else of equal capabilities and from a competitive point of view, to find those people, you have to accommodate their compensation. So to answer your question, uh, I, would, I think there are a lot of other counties that would be happy to have the boards that we've had and the administrative capability that's, been, that's provided us the funds that we have to weather ourselves through difficult times while we improve our economy and move things forward. Thanks. Henry, would you like to respond? Having worked for counties before, I hesitate to chop someone's head who I have not really interviewed. The only way I'm going to find out the efficiency of this guy is if I can step into the back rooms behind the closed doors and take a look at what's going on. Now understand something. A government is neither effective nor efficient. It's only product. It's not widgets. It's people. It's people being people. So when we talk about production, we talk about effectiveness. That's really relative. You are correct. Too many people in government are being overpaid. I have not looked at the salary ordinance. I don't want to see it. My wife said, well, what does this position pay? I don't know. I don't want to know. It pays better than my retirement, I'm sure. But I don't want to know. And I go, to answer your question, you know, if the guy's not doing his job and we don't even need him, then I would have to suggest he seek employment. My, the competing county can have him. But I don't know this person personally, and I have not had the opportunity of investigating it at that level. But that's not the issue. The issue is, is that this man does not represent, he's not accountable to the people. That, that, that in he, itself, he is, right, that we're is being governed. Question. Huh? Yeah, you're gonna have, to, that was your only question, so thank you. No, I'd like to answer him. As long as you have time. Okay. Do I have time? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. We're being governed by people who are appointed to office and not accountable to the citizens. That individual is accountable. If I'm the, the uh, commissioner, he's accountable to me. You hold me responsible. And then I have to make the prudent decision. And if, it, if what you're saying is true, then my, my position would be to cut his... This is to delete his position. Okay? All right. Rick, go ahead. Well, absolutely. Every experience I've had with Danny, uh, he seems to be uh, prepared, informed, intelligent, and I do know of a lot of uh, programs uh, that I think have been instituted by him that have, that have helped this county stay in the, the fin financial and fiscal uh, position we're in, and we are in pretty good shape uh, in comparison to surrounding counties. I'm not going to attribute that all to him, but I think obviously he has a big part in that. Uh, as far as his power, I'm a pretty independent thinker, and if I'm the elected official and I think somebody's usurping or undermining uh, authority that, that actually lies with me, then I'm, I'm going to say do something about that. Um, Danny, I believe, brings recommendations, but the board is, is the, the body that votes on those. Um, and I don't intend to be swayed uh, by something I don't believe, no matter who it is that's bringing those opinions. Uh, so I don't intend to have that problem. Excellent. Thank you. This gentleman right here. Yeah, I'd like to know 
what you would do, say, with respect to an issue here in the county, the county level, of uh, putting meters on private wells. That seems to be percolating up again. And would you in favor of an ordinance banning putting meters on private wells, or would you think that's okay, and what would be the reason for your position? Sir, do you direct that to all candidates? No. Okay. Uh, Henry, in particular, uh, have you heard of the ordinance to put meters on I don't have private to hear wealth? it. I can tell you how I believe in it right now. No, 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 no meters on private wells. I have two wells. People, it's enough cost to keep them operational. I don't need to pay to pump my own water. You know, that water comes from pass-through water that goes under your land. You're only taking a small amount to operate on. I know you, you, you find that these government agencies say, well, that water belongs to the government. It belongs to the administration. It belongs to BLM or it belongs, whatever the agency is, that belongs to the agency. No, no, that isn't the way it is. It is if you allow it. It is if you don't say no. But no, no meters on private wells. That's just the bottom line. You know, you're going to have to get, people, you're going to have to get a little emotional about some of the things now. Hell no. You know, <laughs> speak up. When, you feel good when you finish. Take a stand. No, that's just further encroachment of government. That's us. You know, I look out here at the audience. And you've got a, I'm glad I'm not you and I'm standing up here. Because you have a, a wonderful slew of people with backgrounds to choose from. I know who I'm going to vote for. It's, it's easy. But anyhow, I thank you for the time there. I hope I answered your question. No meters on private wells. Okay. Rick? Yeah, I, I believe that's an unnecessary intrusion, too. And I. I Really, again, uh, all of the monitors, we're talking about gasoline monitors on cars, we're talking about monitors here, the cameras, are, I, I think it needs to be halted uh, and reversed, and this is just another example of unnecessary, unreasonable intrusion. Um, I think things can be monitored much better without a constant, uh, again, meter or, or some monitoring device, another one, that intrudes on our privacy uh, and, and our personal property and our rights. Um, and I would be opposed to that. Excellent. Joel? I'll just simply say I am opposed to meters on private wells, and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Colleen? Of course I'm against meters on wells. But you know, government sneaks in, don't they? They already have meters and streams. Our county commissioners approve them. <coughs> Every year, more meters on streams. We have water resource department in the county courthouse, but we'll say no meters on our wells. And when will that? When will we have to stop that? You know, I think we have to watch it as it trickles in, like a sneaky snake, because that's what government does, and they're moving in on our county. And we need people in leadership in this county that will watch for that for you, and not let it happen. Not just when it's too late. Say no, we can't do that, and it's too late. We've taken the money. We've been bought out. And I think we have to be careful. Yes, sir. In the back. Right. I'm against the expansion of the government, and so I sat by and watched something happen up at Howard Prairie Lake this last couple of years, where the private contractor that operated the lake for many years, and it was a wonderful place to go while he was op operating that, the county took it over because they could make more money, they said, than the Lucy paid the county. I wonder if in decision making, if you get all the facts, I really wonder how many more government employees it took to operate Howard Prairie now, plus their salaries, their pensions, all of the costs, took it out of the private sector completely. But that's decision making, and you wonder whether somebody looks down the road 10 minutes to see what the total cost is going to be. And that, to me, was an 
improper decision. And it, it, it impacted more than just Howard Curry, its other camp facilities that were operated the same way. But more government expansion, but the total cost in PERS alone could never replace what the contractor that was running it gave the county. Don, is the question? The question is, how does a decision like that get made? That had to, somebody at the county, the commissioners, had to approve that. And so, do they get all the facts that are considered that go into the future for a cost of taking over something? And I know that you're not a commissioner, but you're going, one of you going, two of you are going to be commissioners. But that's an expansion of government that had no need to happen. Hyatt Lake, very similar with the Bureau of Rec Reclamation, took out the, the boating ramps. Beautiful, wonderful ramps. Gone. So Don, do you think they? Do you think they? Government, government. Don, do you think they didn't look at all the facts before they made they their decision? They did decisions? not look at the facts. I can okay. tell you, there's no way that 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 would that long-range implication of the employees and the PERS that's involved can no way match what they were getting for the cost it, of the public. It came out that he had defaulted on his lease payments. I think, if I'm correct, he had defaulted That's on his lease payment. Management. Get another operator. So instead of taking it over by government. County. As for Cahob, they took over a wonderful operator in there. They took it over. So they say they make money. They make more than the leasee was paying, but in total cost, there's no way that government is operating that cheaper than the cost to us as taxpayers. So you're thinking long term, they didn't look at all of it long term. I will guarantee you they didn't. Anyone else on the forum want to comment on that? <clears throat> related to either long term planning or oversight related to that particular issue? I don't have the specifics of that decision making process, um, but I can tell you that generally it's better to, pri to privatize operations because they have to operate on a profit motive. So it makes sense to do that everywhere that you can. Now, we do have some enterprise um, uh, departments, such as the airport that's operated by government for um, uh, creating revenue, and it exceeds its cost, and we'll be doing the same thing with the fare as well, and uh, it will be operating to uh, exceed its cost as well. So there probably are reasons why you might do that in certain cases, maybe for liability issues or something like that, but otherwise privatizing is the way to go if you can, I think. Okay. Anyone else want to comment? Colleen? That was before reporting days of the commissioners, I think. But I was at the meeting uh, since they took over all the parks and they have this wonderful revenue generating stream. They raised the fees so they can compete with the private sector. They didn't keep the fees low because there is more costs. And I agree with you. I don't think it belongs in county hands. Neither do I think the U.S. Cellular Tower that they bought out at the Expo should be an investment. Our government shouldn't be have a portfolio that is magnificent. It should be a servicing government streamlined body, not an investment business. And I agree with you. I would privatize as much and turn it back over to the people to operate. It's ours. Henry? No. Quickly, if you can, sir. Huh? Quickly. Quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you have to understand, government is funded by appropriations. So not in the business to make money. You are correct. That could be operated better by a private facility because they're not charging fees to make the government money. It is a management issue. And in this case, it would be cheaper to privatize it. And you'll probably get better services without more regulations. Government is in there to collect money through regulations, through fees, through all kinds of BS. So yeah, I will agree with you. It should stay in the hands of private management at this time. Rick? I'll be very brief. I don't know the details of this particular instance, but I do believe that in the history of the world, um, the government has never operated anything nearly as efficiently as private enterprise. So I would imagine that's the case. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're uh, pushed. I ran 15 minutes over to take all of the great questions, so I apologize for that. I'd like to take our, our, uh, our candidates' closing 
uh, comments this evening. They have uh, paraphernalia back on the tables. I'm sure they would love to speak with you afterwards. So we'll quickly go through that. We're reversing the order that they spoke in originally. And Henry, we'll start by Colleen, Rick, and then Joel will finish. So uh, Henry, your five minute. Five minutes. You get five minutes on your closing statement. What I would like to, the dimension I would bring to the board is, as you can see, I'm a little more outspoken. I'm not as well polished because the response for me are a little more emotional. I bring the, I think it's safe to assume that we interpret, we evaluate, and we base decisions primarily on our personal life experiences. We don't do any in-depth research. What I bring to the board is a diversity <coughs> of experiences and education, both as a teacher and as a student, as a person who has been in business and understands the intricacies involved, someone who's been in government and understands exactly what's happening. And for me, when I look into the audience, uh, you have a difficult decision. You have a lot of good people here, and we each bring a different perspective. Not just the choice that you have to make, is that perspective. I thank you. Colleen. Well, I just thank you for coming again and for your good questions and for challenging um, us to think and commit to you to serve you. And um, as citizens of Jackson County, we just need to take our government back. It needs to be for, of, and by the people. And as I see it operating now, it's for, of, and by government. Um, I bring leadership through uh, the experiences of private business and through an education that has the capabilities to budget and to prioritize and to listen to the people. We need uh, transparency. I know it's such a catchphrase, but I really feel we need a transparent government. One that I go to the commission meetings every week and I take people with me and they pretty soon they drop off. They go, Colleen, I can't take that anymore. What kind of government do we have where people get tired of or feel it's worthless to go and contribute their ideas and they go or they're belittled for actually questioning or challenging their leaders? You know, that's not the kind of leadership we need. We need leadership that is responsive to the people, and that is the kind of leader I will be for you. My po opponent and I bring stark differences to government perspective for your consideration on this Republican ticket. Um, Joel brings um, an extensive planning, entrenched government philosophy. I bring a representative of the people. I bring a citizen's represent representation to government, not one that is entrenched in RPS and has held the line, has been the watchdog, and has propelled it to where it is today. We need someone to say no more in Jackson County. Um, uh, Joel was in an interview, I just, and it, it was repeated many times. He said he wouldn't fight. We don't need fights. We can't afford those. You know, we have a business, and we had a government entity come into our business after about 18 years of being there. And it was a government, federal government man with no authority in my shop wanting to see a grease trap. We've been in business forever. We never had that experience. I said, what are you looking for? He said, well, we, we have a new fog program, and we want to see. And, you know, I wouldn't have been a fighter. I said, well, just a minute, I'll get it ready for you. No, I was busy. I said, you can come back Monday. I'll have it open for you. And he said, well, that, no, it's supposed to be a surprise inspection. I said, well, you know what? It isn't happening today. And that's not a fight. That's a stand. He left. He brought me back material, and he hasn't been back since. And I just think we give up our freedoms for no stand. It may cause a fight. It may not. But without that stand, we're rolling over and going down. And I want Jackson County to be prosperous. And that happens with freedom, with free people, with um, government uh, out of the way, and a constitutional foundation, and common sense leadership. How, we've, how the vote comes out in the election, we need people in office that will make common sense policy, not leaving it to the big players or making punitive uh, actions because of their vote. 
We need people that will stand by the citizens and project prosperity and uh, a fueled economy in this county. And I just hope if you share my vision for a freer, more prosperous Jackson County, that you will support my campaign, you'll vote for me before that May 20th deadline, and um, see a real difference in Jackson County leadership that you've never seen before. Rick. I won't take my entire five minutes here. I think we've, we've all said a whole lot tonight, but I just want to let you know, uh, I have a passion for Jackson County. Uh, I grew up here. Um, I was educated here. I've been raising my family here. I have a business here. Um, I am firmly entrenched in Jackson County and committed, I, and like I say, I have a great passion. I've given back uh, my, my service on the RBTD board. Uh, just fueled my desire to give more, even more, and everything that I have. I, I love volunteering in our in youth activities. I, I volunteer in the schools. Um, giving back is, is just part of who I am. Um, I believe I have a unique skill set. I believe I have a lot of unique abilities. Uh, I think I can do a lot of good for Jackson County. I intend to, to be there doing everything I can for as long as the voters will have me, within reason. <laughs> uh, but I will definitely appreciate your support and your vote uh, in May, and hopefully in November as well. Thank you. Joel, so, go ahead. You know, there's a burden that comes with real knowledge and real experience and real leadership and platitudes and advocations of fighting fights that lead to nowhere, that lead to additional costs, that disrupt the opportunity for real enterprise, real growth, real prosperity, real opportunity that meets the challenges that we are really faced with, accommodating the laws that we have to accommodate and changing those as we go forward, as I have for the past nine years of volunteer involvement. Not one time in the seven years that I've been on the Planning Commission has my opponent been in a Planning Commission meeting. We hear the argument all the time that we never know about anything. There's no reason that anybody in this room should not know about what's going on because everything is noticed repeatedly in various places. It requires getting involved. It requires that you take the responsibility that as a Republican we all say we should, we should do. Be, be responsible. Now, I want to say this also, I'm happy to have been here. On the Planning Commission, I listen to divergent viewpoints all the time. And oftentimes, views from the extremes, one side or the other, are beneficial because it helps you come to resolution. But it's that stated leadership, that ability to determine and, and homogenize a reasoned conclusion that will afford the most people the best answer is something that I have done repeatedly over the past seven years and also did that as a division president for a large organization. This county is a $306 million budget coming up in the 1415 budget. We have nearly 900 employees. We have 19 departments. We have 18 department heads. We have three commissioners. We have one administrator. We have numerous activities that go on. There's a lot of moving parts. I have had experience in that and we do not need an individual now with no experience on a commission that will have one lasting commissioner that has only been on for two years and another new one. We need real experience in this county and I will provide it to you in a strong conservative fashion and I will get the most bang for the buck out of every buck that we have. Thank you. Ottawa. Thank our candidates this evening for coming out. You it's grueling. No, no. We got all our. Sorry. Thank you for watching. I want to thank all of our candidates this evening. We had a lot of great questions that we just couldn't quite get to in the time constraint. But I, I, I do want to thank uh, the two groups that put this on this evening. So a round of applause for our candidates. And a round of applause for uh, 
Tom Steen and Mary Johnson with Americans for Prosperity. And also for Debbie Myers and for Kevin and for Colby with Campaign for Liberty. As your monitor, as your moderator, I've enjoyed it this evening. Thank you so much and appreciate you coming down on, on a busy season. But it takes Americans, it takes Americans to stand up and I want you to pass that along. It's a civil discourse we had tonight and that makes it so much more enjoyable when you have a civil discourse with folks, whether they agree or disagree. And I have a quote from Abraham Lincoln. He said, America will be destroyed from the outside. If we falter and lose our freedoms, it will be because we destroyed ourselves. And so you think about that, that if we don't do something, we the people, and I talk about that on the show all the time, the Constitution, when you read it, it gives me goosebumps <laughs> because every word in the Constitution was hammered out for about seven years before they finally ratified it to the states. Can you only imagine seven years of constitutional uh, discussion? And so we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our forefathers to stand on the Constitution and the rights that they give us. And we, the people, hold the politicians accountable. So thank you very much, everybody. We're adjourned. Have a great evening.